Well, thank you, Ingo and, and Joachim, for putting together this session that I'm proud to contribute to. I would need to get my slides and the remote uh, control, if that's possible. Where's the remote? So we have heard quite a bit about the potentials of GM crops, about the criticism against GM crops. We haven't talked much about the impacts of GM crops, meaning the impacts of those crops that are already out there. And that's something that I've been working on for about 20 years. Uh, and I'd like to report a little bit uh, from the research that my group has done and, and that of others, of course. Uh, let's first of all take a look at uh, how much and where GM crops are being grown in the world. Um, if you can get back to the slideshow, thank you. Uh, so we see here that uh, the cultivation of GM crops started in the mid-1990s and uh, the blue line that you're seeing here is uh, how it increased at the global level. Uh, last year in 2015, um, there were about 180 million hectares globally grown with GMOs. Uh, that's about 13% of the global uh, arable land area. And the green and the red lines show uh, the breakdown by developed countries. Uh, this is the red line. And by developing countries, this is the green line. And we are seeing that actually in developing countries, more GMOs, a large area of GMOs is already grown uh, than in, in rich countries. Uh, the world map that you're seeing in the background, uh, all those uh, countries that are colored in green, uh, they're growing significant areas uh, with GMO and we see a heavy dominance in North and South America. Uh, then we see quite a few countries in uh, Asia, uh, China and India in particular, Australia, but also a few countries in Africa and hardly anything in Europe except for smaller areas uh, grown with GM maize in uh, Spain and Portugal. But uh, Peter Raven uh, pointed out a very important thing, namely uh, GM crops. What is that? We are talking about uh, a breeding technique and obviously it depends a lot uh, what types of traits we're breeding for. And uh, unfortunately, even though we are talking about 20 years of commercial applications, it's uh, basically only two traits that have uh, been grown uh, at larger scale, uh, and that is herbicide tolerance and insect resistance uh, in crops such as uh, soybean, uh, maize, uh, cotton, uh, and a few others. And uh, without going into details, this is not a technical question. Uh, many more traits have been developed and tested, uh, but they haven't been pushed forward. They haven't been approved uh, due to the uh, complexities in the public and policy debate. But nonetheless, let's look at what we know about the uh, impacts of those crops that are out there over the last 20 years. Uh, a large number of studies have been carried out by different research groups focusing on different countries, looking at uh, the different crop trade combinations, using the different types of data, experimental data, farm survey data, uh, one year data collection, several years of data collection, different statistical methodologies, and obviously different results, uh, because when you're looking at uh, impacts in one country or one technology, then we couldn't expect that the results are going to be exactly the same as those of another technology in another country. But when, uh, as scientists, uh, sometimes we naively believe that uh, the more knowledge is being generated, uh, the better, um, you know, uh, everybody's informed and uh, it'll, it'll contribute uh, to a more science-based debate. Uh, the opposite has happened. I mean, uh, because we have a variety of studies out there, everybody picks the studies that they like most, um, GMO supporters as well as opponents. And in the end, uh, the more studies we have, the more that's contributing to polarization. Uh, there is a lot of confirmation bias in how we are digesting information, how we are using information. Uh, and, and that's a problem uh, because science in the end is suffering and, uh, and it's not uh, facts anymore that uh, the debate is based on. 
We thought uh, some time ago that perhaps doing a meta-analysis uh, is a, a useful approach on the one hand to learn uh, a little bit more about uh, taking all those studies, what can we learn about uh, the effects on average, but also to explain the reasons for the observed heterogeneity, uh, knowing uh, under what conditions technologies will have what type of effects. And if you look at the results of this meta-analysis, uh, which includes um, uh, with several hundred observations for some of the uh, outcome variables here, we see on average for GMOs uh, across the studies uh, that have been carried out in the world uh, about 22% higher yields of uh, GMOs in comparison to conventional bread crops. Uh, a reduction in uh, the use of chemical pesticide quantities of about 37%. Uh, not much change in production costs. Uh, seeds are more expensive, yes, but savings in terms of chemical pesticides, so no uh, change in net costs, but uh, a large change in uh, the profits that farmers are gaining, um, close to 70% uh, on average. Those are highly statistical results, and uh, if you look at the uh, New York Times article that was claiming uh, no effects uh, on yields, uh, that's wrong. Uh, we see effects on yields, uh, but uh, if you pick out individual studies, individual regions, then certainly uh, you're, you may get uh, different pictures. Uh, here's the distribution of the results on yields. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are a few studies that show uh, small yield effects, even uh, negative yield effects uh, that may be due to the reason that uh, technology has been incorporated into germplasm that doesn't work well in a particular setting. Uh, and when you're not controlling for those effects, you may even get negative effects. Uh, but we see, obviously, the large majority of the studies show positive effects uh, at different uh, magnitudes. Uh, so how can we uh, explain uh, the differences? Uh, one important aspect is that we are talking currently about two very different traits. Um, there's uh, herbicide tolerance and there's insect resistance, uh, which you see here in the second and third row of the uh, column of this uh, table. And clearly, uh, we are seeing that uh, insect resistance has contributed much more positively to higher yields and lower pesticide quantities uh, than herbicide tolerance. I mean, for herbicide tolerance, we are not even seeing any significant effect on, on the uh, use of chemical pesticides. This is herbicides in this context. In some regions, uh, there has been a reduction. In other regions, there has even been an increase. So uh, on average, we are not seeing a statistically significant uh, result here. Uh, there are other effects uh, that are not uh, covered in many of the studies. Herbicide tolerance has helped to reduce soil tillage. Uh, Mariano Bosch has talked extensively about no-till. Yes, that has been facilitated uh, by herbicide tolerance. Uh, that uh, has contributed to lower soil erosion, lower greenhouse gas emissions. But in some regions, it is true that uh, weeds have developed resistance to glyphosate. And that's an issue. But that's an issue that uh, we shouldn't uh, attribute uh, to GMOs. That's an issue that we should attribute to the fact that uh, farmers and perhaps even companies have promoted a technological fix uh, as a substitution for good agronomy, and that's something that's not a good idea. So obviously, uh, we shouldn't uh, substitute uh, seed technologies for agronomy. We need to have sustainable systems, and uh, the system includes good agronomy and good seeds. Uh, and then those things uh, would uh, not happen. Well, uh, there's another uh, factor that contributes to the observed differences. We have run a series of meta regressions. I'm only showing you one result here because that's particularly remarkable. Uh, we have seen that the effects in developing countries are significantly larger. The benefits of GM crops are significantly larger uh, in developing countries than in developed countries. Uh, if you look at the 14 there for yields in developing countries, that has to be interpreted, that controlling for other factors, the 
uh, effect of growing uh, GM crops in developing countries has 14 percentage points higher yields, uh, uh, higher yield effects uh, than in developed countries. And in the same way, we are seeing stronger pesticide reductions in the developing world and uh, much higher farmer profits as compared to the effects in developed countries where actually these technologies have primarily been developed for because uh, most of these technologies were uh, developed by Monsanto for the U.S. market, uh, but they are now being used in developing countries with larger benefits. What are the reasons? Why are the effects larger in developing countries? Uh, there are particularly two reasons. One is that, um, well, this is about pest control, uh, insects, uh, weeds, uh, and uh, it happens that in tropical and subtropical climates, um, farmers suffer more uh, from uh, crop damage uh, through these uh, pests and diseases, and that's why the value of the technology is higher. Uh, the other reason is a more institutional and economic one, because the GM technologies that are patented in the U.S. are not patented to a large extent uh, in poor countries. There is often a misunderstanding that a patent uh, holds globally. There is nothing like a global patent. Patent law is national law, uh, and most of the developing countries haven't granted patents on these technologies, and this means the seed prices are lower, and the share of the benefits that is captured by farmers is higher, and that also means that the profits uh, that the companies make are lower because uh, the premium that they can charge on top of the uh, regular seed prices uh, is much lower when there is no patent protection. So, uh, of course, the benefit distribution depends on institutional aspects such as intellectual property rights. What do we know about GM crop impacts in a small farm context? Uh, not every farmer in a developing country is a small farmer. We see very large-scale farming in Argentina and in Brazil, but there are uh, small-scale farmers in other parts of the world uh, that are using GM crops and particularly insect-resistant uh, so-called BT crops. Uh, and I'd like to show you one example uh, from India. India is the largest cotton-producing country in the world. Uh, and uh, has been using BT, insect-resistant BT cotton uh, technology since 2002. Uh, this is a technology that makes the plant resistant uh, to the cotton ballworm, and this is a nasty pest uh, that's contributing to heavy insecticide use and at the same time also to uh, large losses uh, in effective yields uh, because when the larva of the ballworm enters into the bowl, then uh, it's getting very difficult even to control it chemically. When we are looking at uh, adoption rates uh, in India for this technology, in 2015 there were close to 12 million hectares grown with this BT cotton technology. This is 97 percent of the Indian farmers who have opted for this technology. And these are small farmers uh, with average areas of one or two hectares. So we're talking about 8 million farmers who have decided uh, since, uh, you know, you're seeing the, the takeoff phase there uh, around 2006 uh, that are growing uh, and making a decision to uh, use BT cotton seeds year after year. Uh, one uh, little footnote here, some people are getting concerned that when close to 100% of the cotton area is grown with BT cotton, that this would be one variety. And that would be awful because it would lead to a loss of varietal diversity, but I can uh, assure you this is not one variety. There are over 1,000 different uh, BT cotton varieties out there, so it's a technology that you're incorporating uh, into the different local varieties and hybrids that are used, uh, and uh, over 1,000 uh, is the most uh, recent number here. We have uh, collected uh, quite comprehensive data from over 500 uh, randomly selected uh, farm households uh, in uh, the major cotton belts of uh, central and southern India. Since 2002, uh, we have been running a panel survey. We went back every two years uh, to the same farmers in order to collect uh, data on their agronomic uh, situation, uh, but also on their socioeconomic uh, situation. And collecting such panel data, and that's a fairly uh, unique data set um, that we have put together there, 
uh, has several advantages. First of all, you're able to look at effects also over time. So not only in a snapshot situation, there may be things such as resistance developments uh, that you couldn't capture when you're only having a snapshot. Uh, and the other advantage is uh, that uh, you're better able to control for biases. I mean, people always say, yeah, but what happens uh, if the farmers who are using BT cotton are better educated or have better extension services or have better access to irrigation? Is it what you're finding then really an effect of the technology or is that something due to other observed or unobserved factors that's biasing the results? And panel data helps us uh, to use statistical differencing techniques uh, to control uh, for those types of biases. Let me show you some of the major results. Uh, here we are seeing a reduction in the use of chemical insecticides uh, for conventional compared to BT cotton. In the early period of adoption, the 2002 to 2004 period, uh, a notable reduction of 37%. But what happened then? I mean, if there were resistance development in the pest populations, we would expect an increase uh, in the use of chemical insecticides after some time. Uh, what we are observing is the opposite. Uh, it f f uh, went further down. And now you may be surprised and, and say, well, but wait a minute, conventional cotton also went down. What happened there? But remember that we are talking about uh, over 90% uh, of BT cotton use. And what we are seeing is an area-wide suppression of the uh, ballworm uh, pests so that uh, there isn't uh, as heavy pest pressure around because there are only little pockets of non-BT cotton. Most of the area is BT cotton and that has controlled area-wide uh, that uh, pest population. And now, okay, the data end in 2008. Uh, we have certainly looked into more aggregate data in order to see what happened after that. Uh, and we don't see even after that an increase uh, in the use of chemical pesticides. Uh, so it remains significantly lower than it was. And it's important to mention um, that uh, it's particularly the most toxic chemical insecticides that have been reduced, products that have been uh, prohibited in Europe uh, for decades because they're so toxic, they're still used in India. And that certainly, that reduction has environmental benefits. It also has significant health benefits because cotton production in India is manually done. It's manually sprayed. It's manually harvested. And uh, we are seeing notable reductions in the uh, health incidence uh, during and after pesticide spraying uh, through the adoption of uh, BT cotton technology. What does it mean for farmer uh, yields and, and profits. Uh, we have run um, a series of uh, different models in order to uh, control for biases, and we are seeing on average an increase of 24% uh, in cotton yields. And that's not higher yield potential. That's really only a reduction in the crop losses that would otherwise occur because farmers are not uh, effectively controlling the pest. The BT does control it much more effectively. And we have uh, tried uh, different specifications to see whether the effect uh, decreased over time. None of the specifications shows a decrease. Some of the models show constant effect. Some of the models show even an increasing effect in yields over time. Uh, and the same holds true for profits, 50% uh, higher profits uh, for uh, farmers. That's quite significant. And uh, I've told you that these farmers are predominantly small scale. Many of them are really poor below the poverty line. And uh, we have data also on their socioeconomic situation. And we are seeing that their household living standards, which uh, we measure through the household consumption value, that's uh, uh, the, the most common figure in development economics to measure household living standards, has increased by 18%. Uh, as a net effect of adopting uh, BT cotton uh, seeds. We've also looked uh, what this means uh, for different types of uh, household welfare indicators, uh, such as uh, diets and nutrition. Uh, we see increases in dietary consumption of calories, uh, in dietary quality, uh, in terms of calories from higher value foods. We've also run a series of models about micronutrients, and we do find significant effects on micronutrient consumption. And obviously, this is not due to the fact that cotton is so nutritious. No, it's the, the income, the 
additional income uh, that puts households in a position uh, to access, uh, have better access uh, to uh, food and dietary quality. Those are the farm households. But now imagine that uh, millions of farm households in the rural context are starting to use a new technology. Obviously, that has spillover effects for the local economy. Uh, there's uh, additional cotton that needs to be traded, uh, additional cotton that needs to be processed. And even on the cotton fields, there is a lot of additional labor that's being employed. We are seeing 40% uh, additional demand for labor because, uh, because just uh, more is being harvested. Uh, and we have put together all those direct and indirect benefits. Uh, and we are seeing that uh, one hectare of BT cotton has about uh, 250 uh, additional dollars uh, uh, as compared to conventional cotton. Uh, and when we look at uh, what that means for India as a whole, it's close to 3 billion US dollars. And when we look at who is actually benefiting, here's a disaggregation by different income levels. And we're seeing that 66%, two thirds of the overall income that is generated in the local economy uh, through the adoption of BT cotton is captured by farm families with less than $2 a day, so by extremely and moderately poor households. So a clear example of poverty reduction effects. Of course, we have limited examples, and the reason is that uh, there are only limited examples out there. Um, could I get my, my last slide? Um, uh, there's uh, various other things uh, that have been tested uh, that haven't made it uh, to the market yet. The question is, will these technologies ever be commercialized? We'll have a discussion uh, about that question, and that's not a technical question, that's a question of the political debate. Uh, and I think as a conclusion, uh, there is evidence uh, that uh, obviously uh, GMOs uh, not to be misunderstood as a panacea, but uh, as a technology that can contribute to pro-poor sustainable development, and uh, there is uh, no uh, evidence and there are no arguments scientifically to ban this technology, but that's effectively what's happening in Europe uh, and that's effectively what's happening also in Africa and other parts of the world. Uh, and that's uh, a concern um, that uh, I hope we are going to discuss. Thank you very much.